Well, it's been the last week. This last week was uh, the end of the semester for both me and Justin, and we both had a final paper due. And so I was also writing a sermon at the same time, and I'm hoping that I don't get the two confused. Because I don't really think you want to hear about my ethics paper. I read this story about a missionary who lived in this remote area, but he had people that were scattered, and, and he needed to go visit them, and he needed a car. So somebody gave him a car, but you know how sometimes you get what you pay for? And the car had a problem with the starter. So in order to get it started, he would have to get some schoolboys to push it, to get it going, and then he could start it. And he was always careful when he visited people to leave it running or to park it up on a hill so he could coast down and get it started again. Well, he became ill and needed to go on a leave of absence, and somebody came to replace him. And so the missionary was telling the new guy, this is how you start this car. And the new guy, you know, opened the hood and looked inside and said, well, brother, there's nothing wrong with this car. This, this wire here just needs to be attached. And sure enough, it started right up. The power was there all the time. Well, this is the second week of our Empowered sermon series about the Holy Spirit. And today I want to look at something that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Last week, Pastor Brian talked to us about the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we hear a lot about the Father, we hear a lot about God, we hear a lot about Jesus, but not so much about the Spirit. So we want to take this month to focus on that person of the Trinity. You won't find the word Trinity in your Bible. Did you know that? But you will find the community of the Trinity focused on throughout Scripture. Because God is infinitely more than we could ever explain or describe. The Trinity is a hard concept to wrap our minds around. God is a community of relationships. The three persons of the Trinity are eternally connected. And they never act independently. As we'll see in the scripture passage today, there is a loving communication and cooperation within the Trinity. It's a life of love and holiness between the three persons. And through Jesus Christ, we are invited to participate in that life, that presence of God, the Trinity. And we have the Holy Spirit within us. When Christians ignore the Holy Spirit, they miss out on the power available to them. I want to show you a little something here. Okay, so this is generic Alka-Seltzer. And... Uh, so you're supposed to put it in the water. So that's one way of doing it. Or you can open up the package. Flop, flop, fizz, fizz. Yeah, you've heard that one. And then that happens, if you can see that from where you are. See, the Holy Spirit is in each believer. When you accept Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. But our goal is to unwrap it and let it fill our whole life. But if we just ignore the Holy Spirit, it just sits there like that package of Alka-Seltzer that I didn't open up. So our goal is is to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. But in order to do that, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to control and occupy every part of our life. How much of the Holy Spirit, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? 
The scripture passage we're going to look at today is in John 16. John is the fourth and final gospel. It's really almost to the end of the Bible. And it's chapter 16. If you want to look that up in your, in your pew Bible or you want to get out your phone and pretend like you have a Bible on there, but really you're just on Facebook, I won't know the difference. <clears throat> Um, But we're in John 16, and we're starting in chapter 5. Now, this is right before Jesus is going to be betrayed and go to the cross. And he's talking to his disciples. Like for three or four pages, he's talking to his disciples, and he's telling them things. And he says, but now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where, I'm a, where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. Well, of course, they're grieving. This is their friend. They love him. And they thought he was going to lead a revolution. And now he's saying, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to go. I'm going to leave you. They are sad and they are confused. But Jesus promises them that the Holy Spirit will teach them what they need to know and remind them of what they have already learned from him. So it goes on. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. The word advocate in Greek is paraclete. And it means counselor, one who encourages, helps, comforts, And also, one that is called to come alongside to help or to plead one's cause. So it's kind of an amazing combination of defense lawyer, teacher, and therapist. Just like this next image. So Jesus will no longer be with them in the flesh, but will be with them in the Holy Spirit and they will not be alone. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we have what we call the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and make disciples in my name, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have taught you, and I will be with you till the end of the age. How can Jesus be with them till the end of the age if he's going back to heaven? Because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming, and the Holy Spirit is God. So let's go on now. He also says to them, and when he comes, meaning the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me, Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Because Jesus gave up his life on the cross and then was resurrected and went to heaven, we can be made righteous when we believe him and accept him as our Savior and Lord. That righteousness is only available because Jesus came and did what he did when he took our sins to the cross. The Holy Spirit works in us, convicting us and convincing us that we need to repent. We call it prevenient grace, the grace that comes before we even know we need it. That is how much God loves you. That before you even knew about Jesus, God was working to lead you to Jesus. If you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, I want you to know that God is seeking you. He wants to have a relationship with you, but he's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to force his way into your life. God is waiting on you to make the choice. So Jesus says that the ruler of this world, Satan, has already been judged. 
See, evil has an expiration date. We don't know what it is. We don't know when that date is, but it will not last forever. Sooner or later, Jesus is coming back, and evil will be no more because Jesus has already defeated Satan. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but while we wait, we have power. We have the Holy Spirit, the power in us, and the name of Jesus to overcome evil. We have what it takes to overcome whatever Satan throws at us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Satan may make our lives miserable, but he will not win. So Jesus goes on. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Those poor disciples, they were, they were overwhelmed. They had learned so much from Jesus in the short time they'd been together. And, and then in like three or four pages of this chapter, or this, this book of the Bible, he's like throwing all this other stuff. I'm going to die, and there's this Holy Spirit thing that's coming, and um, you know, you're going to be able to do things, and I'm not going to be here, but it'll be all right. And Jesus knew they could only take so much. It's the same, same way with us. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth because we can't handle knowing everything at once. God doesn't just open up our brains when we become Christians and dump all the information in. No, we learn it. We learn it gradually, just like we teach kids the alphabet and then words and then sentences. It's kind of the same thing. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth by helping us understand the scriptures when we read them. Did you catch that? When we read them, we have to read them and hear them and pray them and study them and ponder them. The Holy Spirit doesn't do all the work for us. We have to do work too. We have to read what's in here, asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand. And you know, you may read a passage today and the Holy Spirit will speak truth to you in that passage, and next year you'll read the same thing, and the Holy Spirit will teach you something else. It's really cool. This next part of the scripture, this is the part where we see the, the Trinity. You have to kind of keep track of the pronouns in here. He will not speak, or no, he will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. That seems kind of confusing. He, the Holy Spirit, will bring Jesus glory. All that belongs to the Father belongs to Jesus. And the Spirit doesn't speak on his own, but speaks what Jesus tells him. So, Here's the trinity of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Do you see the reciprocal nature there? The Father has, Jesus has, Spirit has, it's all together. And Jesus invites us to be in that. Jesus invites us to participate in the life of the trinity. Jesus teaches us how community ought to be by the Trinity. But like the Alka-Seltzer, and I don't know how anybody drinks that. I don't know. But like the Alka-Seltzer that fills the glass of water up, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. You have to plug into the power source. We waste so much time trying to do things in our own power. Let's just save some time and admit that we can't do it on our own. Life is hard. Following Jesus is hard. It's amazing, but it's hard. We don't always get to do what we want to do. Sometimes we 
We have to go through things we don't want to go through. Jesus promised we'd have trouble. It takes more courage, more strength, more discipline, more energy than we can ever muster up on our own. That's the bad news. Nope, that's the bad news. The good news is we don't have to do it on our own. God asks a lot of us, but he never expects us to do it on our own. We have the Holy Spirit in us, and that is where the power comes from. But the problem is we keep trying to depend on ourselves. I got this. I can do this. Have you ever tried to lose weight or quit smoking or stop swearing or complaining? And you're determined this time it's going gonna, it's gonna to work, it's going to be different, I got a plan, I got a self-help book, I, you know, I can do it. And maybe it does for a little while, but for most people, long-term change is hard to sustain unless you're using the Holy Spirit's power. If God wants you to change, God will give you the power to do it, but you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to help you, and you have to cooperate. You have to give control to the Holy Spirit. When difficult times come in your life, do you say, why me, God? Do you just give up, decide that God hates you, or God's ignoring you? Or do you seek out the Holy Spirit for help, for guidance, for power to get through it? God doesn't hate you. No matter what you think you've done to make God hate you, God does not hate you. God is love. God is love. God loves you. And when you put your trust in God and you give the spirit control, you aren't going to go through trouble alone. You have more power than you realize did I say more power? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have to do our part, like I said. We can't keep eating Twinkies and French fries and sitting on the couch and expect the Holy Spirit to whisk the pounds away, if only. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We have to swap out the bad stuff for the good stuff. And we have to let the Holy Spirit be in charge. We have to let go of wanting to be in control of everything and getting upset when things don't go our way. We can't expect the Holy Spirit to give us power if we haven't given up control of our lives to him. You can't have it both ways. You can't be in control of your life and also have power from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in people who are completely surrendered to God. When we get our will out of the way, we will experience power and be led by the Spirit to do and say things we never thought we could Case in point, I can't do this on my own. If you hear anything good come out of my mouth, that's the Holy Spirit. If you hear stupid stuff come out of my, out of my mouth, that's all me. <laughs> Holy Spirit, just pray and tell God that you're done being in charge of your life and you want to operate in his will and do things his way. Ask the Holy Spirit to change, to take charge of your thoughts and your wants, and your plans, because those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. If you're focused on what you want instead of what God wants, the Holy Spirit can't work in you. When we lay down our desires and seek what God desires, the Holy Spirit can empower us to do whatever God calls us to do. Let's pray together. God, may we lay down our wills and give you charge of our lives so that you can fill us with power so we can do what you want us to do. Amen.